Okay, so now we're going to go back in time. Um, 12 years ago, and that's when uh, I first started using this slide. And all the information I'm going to show you today actually was from a slide set I gave 12 years ago, um, which was prior to TechNote 14. So I think so what we're trying to do is come full circle here as a part of the program and go back 12 years to when um, TechNote Tech 14, uh, 14 was developed. So um, the development of TechNote 14 was done by Joel Poore. Um, I'm not sure where Joel Poore is these days, but he moved on, left Washington, and, and went to manage nutrients elsewhere. Um, but the research that I'm going to show you, and it, it is on-farm research, it's not, um, so, well, it'll be obvious, it's kind of a controlled research situation. Um, so when Joel wrote Techno 14, he considered the Maloney research that I'm going to show you. In addition to that, there was also some guidance that was being used in Whatcom County for low application of manure during winter periods. So that's really the kind of the uh, nutshell of what I'm going to show you is it's, it's, it is winter manure application. It's on low intensity or low application uh, situation. Not very many cows, a lot of acreage, really uh, fine application in terms of small amounts of, of manure. Um, so we looked at this as really being a, a, an assessment of the risk of low applications of manure during the winter season. The winter season in this case was second week in January every year. That's when we applied it for the first time. The second time we applied it during the year was in June. So we applied it once in January, and then they did their um, normal management, which they would cut uh, late May, early June. Um, and then, they, then we would apply manure again, and there would be a later cut during the latter part of the year. So original reason this, this project had gone is they had limited storage on this particular dairy for, for manure. They had about six weeks of storage, and there was interest um, in the early 2000s as the uh, Dairy Nutrient Management Act was, was coming into place and, and being implemented that they wanted this particular farm to have more uh, length of storage for the manure. And they were like, yeah, okay, but, you know, is it really justified? So we stepped in and said, okay, we'd kind of characterize what was going on. So um, it was a transitional organic dairy, grazing-based dairy, located in southwest Washington, milked 60 cows, relatively large land base, 200 acres. So kind of in that um, uh, three acres per cow range. They had approximately six weeks of manure storage, as I mentioned, and they applied manure uh, throughout the year. You can see here, um, approximate location, um, about another hour south of where we are here uh, today. This is the actual, uh, uh, an aerial photo of the field. We had a, a friend of the dairyman that actually had uh, an airplane, took one of our technicians up, uh, or actually grad students. And uh, as you look across the field here, you can see uh, this should look, uh, less green to you. This should also look less green. This should look a little more green than that, but and like twice as much as that and so forth. So these are the actual treatments. Um, after about a year, uh, this is what this field looked like. Uh, so it started in 2002. Manure applied in the winter. In the summer, again, January, about second week of January every year, and then about the second week in June of every year. We had six plots. They were 48 feet by 160. Uh, assigned them a duplicate. We had three, con three treatments. Control, which meant we put nothing on at all. Um, one was the 1x manure application, which was their very low rate that they normally put on. And then the 2x rate was twice their very low rate. Um, so again, you can, I think it's just a cool picture. So in terms of looking at, um, give you a snapshot of some of the data we got from looking at crop uptake. So. If we look at, um, we had the control here, so it'll be this line, one X rate's about 68 pounds of applied nitrogen on 15th of January. Two X rate's about 149 pounds of nitrogen applied on the 15th of January 02. Crude protein is an indicator of, you know, how good job it was doing of feeding the crop. We go from about 17% crude protein up to 20, up to a little over 21 with the two X rate. If we look at the average pounds of forage nitrogen that was taken up per acre, 17 pounds when we uh, increased the rate, well this was their normal rate of application, so it was 34 pounds of uptake, and then from the single cutting, um, if we went to 2x rate, it went up to about uh, 50 pounds of nitrogen uptake per acre. If we express that as a percent of increase in forage nitrogen uptake, we 
by going from control, which was no application, just looking at their, uh, their normal rates, 200%, and it was almost a 300% increase in nitrogen uptake when we went to that 2x rate. Average tons of forage dry matter per acre, 0.32, 0.54, and 0.73. Again, this is a single cutting, not multiple cuttings. Increase in forage yield is a percent then. Uh, by applying their normal rate of 1x, they went up to 169 above um, not applying anything. and went up to 228% if it was applied at this 2x rate. So nitrate, uh, part per million in the top foot, three, three, and three and a half. So low, low, and not much more than low. And then soil ammonium um, in that top foot, 4.4 four and up to about 5.5. So again, real low intensity, uh, low levels of, of soil fertility. Um, actually, a farm that could use some import of nitrogen in order to get um, really good forage yields and greater productivity, but that wasn't their, their farm plan. So give you a little bit of an idea what soil nitrate and ammonium looked like uh, at that point in time. Um, and so this is, um, Got this uh, lined out this way by control in this column, 1x manure treatment, 2x manure treatment, and then this is the average over, um, this would be the, the average for the year across treatments. So year one, two, and three, uh, control uh, soil nitrates around uh, five. Uh, 1x uh, maybe around average of five and a half. And then <clears throat> for the uh, 2x rate, somewhere around six, pretty low. So again, obviously showing that really low rates of, of nitrate application, and it, you can see associated ammonium numbers here, but more often than not, we're, we're really looking at the nitrate values. Okay, so this is uh, the equipment they use for applying the material, it's called splash plate applicator. Um, again, they're able to get out really low rates because of that. Um, so we wanted to look at the crop uptake piece, because that was critical, but the other piece was we wanted to say, okay, if they're applying it during the winter time, what risk is there of runoff to that too? Um, surface water. So we said, okay, we're going to apply before a predicted storm. Now, is that a good thing? Well, if you're doing research and you want to see if there's runoff, yeah, it's a really good thing, but is it something the dairyman ought to be doing? No, and they didn't normally do that. So we had the good fortune that we were able to um, apply after two really big storms, and, or excuse me, we applied just before two really big storms. And um, so that's the data I'm going to show you. So it's not what they should do. It's not what we recommend they do, but it was what we wanted to do because we wanted to see in a worst case scenario what would happen if we had um, a big storm after you at surface applied manure. So on December 12th, this particular year, we applied to a, a smaller part of, of the plot area. It was an area that wasn't part of the um, agronomic growth study. And I'll show you an aerial photo here in a minute. So it was 1.16 hectares, about 2.9 acres. Uh, the application rate is 0.16 acre inches, really small amount. And um, <clears throat> what we did was we applied, in terms of an area, it was four to five times the normal application area that they would have normally applied if they'd gone out on a given day. So we applied a bigger area and we applied it right before a big rainfall. January 27th was the second time we did that. We were able to again predict a, a big storm coming in. Uh, different area than the first one because you don't want to go back and uh, reapply the same area you'd already applied. Again, low, low application rate, and in this case, we were two to three times the normal application area, so in terms of uh, space. We took water samples that were taken from numerous sites along the, what was considered an intermittent stream, only ran during the winter time. We took background samples before the slurry application, so we knew coming in for a couple weeks ahead of time what things looked like. And then we took, uh, the samples were taken sterile, 250 mil bottles, duplicates at five minute intervals. So this is what it looks like. This is the field. Um, when we would go down there, uh, really nice herd of elk up through this area. But here's this intermittent waterway that goes down through here. And um, then also indicate there's a ditch, and this is a lagoon from a beef operation next door. When we were doing this study, and this was a, one of those important ahas that you learn when you get out there and walk these ditches and so forth, you can see kind of brown water coming into this ditch as we walked down through here. And, and when we sampled that coming in from the neighbors, there was actually 4,400 California CFUs of fecals coming in per 100 mils from the neighbors. So when you see data here, it's not just what was coming off of here, it's contribution from, from your neighbor as well. So this was the uh, December application area here. 
So this was point A, B, C, and D. So as the numbers increase, or the, excuse me, as the letters get bigger in the alphabet, they get farther away from the application area. And then in uh, January, this was the application area. Uh, and then again, here's where the research plots were for the agronomic part. Okay, manure nutrients give you an idea of what uh, nitrogen content, ammonium, nitrate, uh, total phosphorus, inorganic phosphorus, total K. So we did take samples on that. Um, December application, um, uh, again, uh, in terms of bugs, we were looking at 10.4 million fecal coliform units, fecal coliform, col colony forming units per 100 mils. Again, that was in this general area, and there's a picture of the equipment spreading it, and that brown uh, layer there is the manure coming out of the back. A um, couple different sampling points, we put flags in, so we know we were pulling the samples. Again, you can see it's this intermittent waterway here. And um, <clears throat> this sampling point, uh, from the point of application, to the point where we sampled, we left a, essentially a grass buffer in there of 10.7 meters um, to that first sampling point. And then from the application area to the second sampling point was 216 meters. So again, it gives you some idea of the distance uh, that we're looking at in the sampling area. Okay, rainfall. So we wanted to apply uh, right before a rainfall. So in the first 24 hours after application, we had a half inch. Within 48 hours, we had 1.1 inches. And within 72 hours, an inch and a half. So considerable rainfall, 12-12-03. Uh, um, so this plot shows um, fecal coliforms per 100 mils. Um, we, this is the, uh, uh, would considered upstream site A, the, 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 uh, the application area. Then when we um, sampled, oops, where is that? What? Where's the up arrow? Okay. Okay. So when we applied uh, manure, we. Um, this would have shown then the bacteria just downstream of that, that site area, and we didn't see any spikes at all, so we got at the application area, and then this would be that 217 meters downstream. We did some DNA fingerprinting, to get an idea of what might be in the, in the bugs at the different sites. We had A, B. Again, remember this is um, just like 10 meters from the site. Uh, this would be about 217 meters, and this was cleared out the corner ditch of the property. Um, so we took nine, 22, and 13 isolates um, <clears throat> in the case right there at the, at the site. 100% of those were from cattle. Once we got down um, downstream, we saw only 82%, and the farther we got away, we realized it was less and less percent that were actually from cattle. So there's other contributions coming in. So it just really convinced me of um, uh, you know, where you sample and, and what you're looking at um, can vary a lot depending on what, what else can contribute to the, that particular geography. January 27th application, 3.3 um, million bugs per 100 mils coming from manure. These are visually what the sites looked like. Again, we were applying up here. We had an upstream uh, site down, and then these would have been downstream. Um, again, we had a nice rain, uh, three-tenths within 24 hours, 1.1 within 48, over two inches within 72 hours. Um, this is the uh, upsite stream, very low levels. Um, manure applied here on the 27th. Uh, we did see a spike um, just below the application area um, on this particular uh, event. And then this one is... Uh, second point downstream and then at a later date we actually saw a little bit uh, another little bit of a hit there again um, if we look at nitrate levels in surface water we happen to, to have those samples archived so we went ahead and looked at those as well as bacteria you, you see some uh, variability there in terms of, of nitrates over time in that surface water um, so from this basically um, we felt that timely applications of dairy manure, when you ought to do it, and not do it right before a storm and at low levels, um, really would, would pose a little risk of bacteria 
um, or nutrient transport to the environment, particularly when you had low application rates and you used a buffer strip as well, uh, or these setback zones, however you best understand that. So, um, how much time? Uh, you have at least five minutes. Okay. Yeah. So, that was the background that went, in, went into the tech note, at least part of the understanding that went into the tech note. Now, so this is some of the, the, the intro that's in the tech note. And so I circled this part because um, there's, there's a lot of considerations that go into when you're actually implementing tech note 14. So um, when at, at the end of the evaluation, you really find out that it's not very many acres or very many conditions that you're actually able to apply uh, winter manure application when you really go through this. But, so in here, anyhow, Joel had put in that figure one shows an average of 20% of annual growth of a crop and nutrient requirement for those perennial cool grasses in western Washington occur during the winter period. So, you know, justification for the crops growing, we could, if it needs nutrients, it might make sense to give it some. So this is the percent of growing degree days, which would be the heat units needed for, um, for growing a crop. Uh, and this is data that's in the Tech Note 14 is the growing degree day base of 40, which is commonly used when you look at grass, uh, different uh, base unit when you're looking at corn. Um, so again, you've got some here in this January, February, you know, even in December, uh, you're beginning to see um, some, uh, some need for that. Then it goes through under this winter period application specifications. Again, it's all in Techno 14. You look at a bunch of characteristics under rates. There's four things to consider there. Under timing, there's a couple of things there. Under method, there's at least four um, things there. So you begin to see a connection between this and what um, Nicole showed you in your last presentation. Lots of stuff to consider when you're doing this um, winter manure application. There's a risk assessment. Um, consider fossil nitrate tests. Consider current phosphorus index. Uh, soil limitations. Look at your soil survey database. Uh, soil erosion estimates. Um, and then there's limitations based on all these risk assessments, assessments and then limitations based on climatic site and operation characteristics. Um, then they go through an example, lots of math, and then there was a number of other references that Joel also considered that went into that tech note. So it wasn't just the Maloney research or it wasn't just the on, on uh, the field practices that were going on in Whatcom County, he considered a number of other things. So um, I guess I'll, I'll stop with that. Uh, there's you know, a lot of other details there on how to implement that tech note 14, but um, that was our journey starting back in the early 2000s. And, getting uh, fully immersed in some of this nutrient management and bacteria and, and the nitrogen cycle, so. All right, thanks Joe. Are there any questions for Joe? Yeah, hi. Um, I was just curious, um, on that January application, you showed that um, sort of later spike that happened. I didn't quite see which site it was at, but I was wondering um, if you had soil bacteria samples as part of this study, as well as the water, and I guess any sort of theories for why that may have happened later. Um, I'm wondering, uh, in the absence of other sources, if it could have given that bacteria can kind of survive a, uh, a number of months in the soil, if it may have been kind of, you know, you see a spike at the downstream site, but not further downstream, if it was potentially, um, you know, kind of mild, migrating almost a soil plume, and then uh, that's a possible explanation for okay. why you got a hit downstream so a few months later. Yep, so after 30 years, what I've learned is um, predict questions. So. Thanks for that one. And here's the soil um, fecal coliforms from that January application. So um, we did take soil samples. We essentially took, and when we took a soil sample, it's not a foot, because you wouldn't necessarily expect bacteria down a foot. I mean, you're really looking at, particularly in surface water, you're looking at that top core. So what we did is we took, um, take coffee cup, uh, like the coffee cups we're drinking, about that size, and punch it down about uh, an inch, so that's that's what we're looking at. Take those cores, bring them back, and then do uh, put them in a stomacher, get the bugs all off of it. So that's that's how we handled and processed the samples. So um, 
for plot M and N, this was uh, the different plots we had, but this is fecal coliforms per 100 grams of wet soil. So that's how we expressed it. And you'll see after that manure application, which was on the 27th, you can see that we had stuff there in the soil for, um, for several weeks. So um, depending on your rain events, that you could have some additional risk if that stuff's getting moved off. So I, I think, yeah, uh, it's possible. But it looks like, uh, you know, the die-off here is uh, within a few weeks. So your risk of subsequent, subsequent losses um, looks like it's minimal after that. We do know from some other work we've done that this is really temperature dependent. So if you get some really cold temperatures, you're going to knock them out really quick. The temperatures during this particular time were pretty temperate. So they were able to survive. Yeah, yeah, um, I believe so. So did you have any um, soil samples outside of the plot, um, kind of where those water sampling sites are located? Uh, the possibility yeah. of maybe moving with the soil versus dying off? Yeah, you know, you're asking me my, my memory of 12 years ago. So um, yeah, some of these are within the plot, and some of them are outside of the plot. Um, so this gives a bit of an idea where M, N, and O were. So those are within. Um, so these are within the plot. Um, o would have been like, like at the edge of the plot. And the, so O is, yeah. So once you're getting outside the plot, it's getting pretty low. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I just have a quick question. I, um, how often were you sampling in the channel downstream after the applications? Um, you know, what our, our typical sampling, what we'd do is we'd, we'd sample every hour when we were there, and we would sample at the top of the hour, and then five minutes after, and then 10 minutes after. So we had three samples within essentially 10 minutes. Um, and then we would do that, that hourly for a number of hours when we were there, and then we would go down weekly. Um, and we had a, you know, it was an hour and a half, hour 45 minutes transit, you know, so it was, it was a four hour round trip. So, and we had to come back to our lab and process everything, process everything in Puyallup. So, um, we pretty much did it on a weekly basis. Other than when we, right after we applied, I mean, we were doing that daily for about a week. And then after that, we did it weekly. Yep. Another question? Yeah, the, um, your, your application rate, the low application rate, and then even the double one, mm -hmm. how, do you know how that matched up with what you would, uh, uh, what you knew about that site as far as its uptake at that time of year or the mass balance sort of thing? Uh, how, was a, was, um, how, how did your application rate match up with what you would, ex would expect as the, like the agronomic rate for that time of year in that field? Okay, so um, I'll answer it this way and then see if, it, if I hit the target for you. So this is a real low intensity farm and their yields on their crops were low. And their yields were low because they had a limited number of cows and a lot of acreage. So if I was actually to be a consultant to them and encourage them to get maximum production out of their land and their dairy, I would have said, get nitrogen in here any way you can. Now, one of the, the struggles is, is that they're organic, okay? So you can't buy commercial fertilizer, all of a sudden there goes your organic certification. So they would have to bring in poultry manure or, or some other organic source. Um, and they just, that wasn't part of their business plan. So, um, so yeah, they weren't anywhere near the ability to produce. I, I would, I'm guessing they're probably at a third of the forage production, they potentially could if they intense if they managed it more intensively from a from a fertilization standpoint. Right. But they just they couldn't bring it in because they're organic. Okay, one last question, Charles. Joe, for those of us that are unfamiliar with Technum 14, was it designed to accommodate groundwater protection? Does somebody from NRCS want to answer that? I would, I would venture to say surface water, but and I, I see an NRCS person saying surface water, no groundwater. Because it's, as I looked at this and all the things they were considering, it really was 
mostly a surface water driven risk assessment. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Okay.